On the morning of Sunday, April 6, 1986, nine-year-old Anthonette Cayadito was reported missing from her family's apartment in Gallup, New Mexico. The initial story coming out of the investigation was that the child went to answer a knock at the door in the middle of the night and mysteriously vanished, assumed abducted by whoever had come to the door. However, more than 30 years later, new information from the investigation has changed everything. From the first moments of her disappearance to the searches conducted for her, much of it appears to be based on lies and deceit. Now, the story of the missing nine-year-old has taken on a new shape, no longer that of a middle-of-the-night stranger abduction, but instead, a sick and twisted tale about a mother's betrayal and a daughter's nightmare. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 219, Case Update, The Abduction of Anthonette Cayadito. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. In today's special update episode, we'll examine the shocking new details about the disappearance of Antoinette Cayadito, previously covered in episode 85. Before getting into the updates, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, episode breakdowns, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or by emailing me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. As a final note, this year, CrimeCon will be taking place in Orlando, Florida from September 22nd through the 24th. I'll be there representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row, and I hope to see you too. Visit CrimeCon.com and use promo code TRACE to save 10% on your pass. That's CrimeCon.com, promo code TRACE. 37 years ago, nine-year-old Antoinette Cayadito went missing. Now, after all that time, it seems that the story of a child taken during the night may have been little more than a cover to hide the hideous truth. This is episode 219, Update, The Abduction of Antoinette Cayadito. Antoinette Christine Cayadito was born to parents Teresa Penny Cayadito and Larry Estrada on December 25, 1976. Antoinette grew up in Gallup, New Mexico, located in McKinley County in the northwest of the state. Gallup sits on what was once Navajo land and now touches the edges of a Navajo reservation to the north. On her mother's side, Antoinette was part Navajo herself. The city of Gallup has a varied population, with 44% of its 22,000 residents coming from a Native American background, and these residents have been described as being from several different tribes, including the Navajo, Hopi, and Zuni. Today, Gallup is known for being an area of high crime, scoring a violent crime rating five times that of the national average. Antoinette lived with her mother and two younger sisters, Sadie and Wendy, in apartment number 9, located at 204 Arnold Street off Route 66. Antoinette attended school as a fourth grader at Lincoln Elementary, located on Old Zuni Road, less than a mile from the apartment. According to all reports, she was a bright young woman who never caused any trouble and was described as being mature for her age and well-behaved. According to her sisters, Antoinette was, in a way, their second mother. She babysat when her mother was out, did the laundry, and even prepared meals. It seems apparent that Antoinette, as the eldest, took on a great deal of responsibility, and it's been reported multiple times that Penny would typically spend her nights out with friends at bars dotted along Route 66. Antoinette would be home looking after her sisters with or without the aid of a babysitter. Frequently, Penny would be out with friends into the late hours of the night, and that would be the exact situation which occurred on the evening of Saturday, April 5th, 1986. 33 years old and a mother to three young daughters, Penny had plans to go out with friends that Saturday night. While it was reported at the time that Penny had left the children in the care of a babysitter, over the years, no names have ever materialized or been presented. It appears in retrospect 
that there may not have been any babysitter, and Antoinette was designated to look after her sisters, as she often did. According to police reports, Penny arrived home at approximately midnight. Though she would send Sadie and Wendy to bed, Penny stated that Antoinette stayed up with her and the two chatted into the early morning hours, not lying down for bed until approximately 3 a.m. At the time, despite the children having their own rooms, they all tended to sleep together in Penny's bedroom. While Antoinette shared the bed with her mother, her siblings slept on a makeshift bed right next to them. According to Penny, there came a knock at the door sometime around 3 a.m., but no one answered it. However, she later reported that there was a second knock sometime between 3.30 and 4.30 a.m. and that Antoinette had gone to see who it was. At approximately 7 a.m. on Sunday, April 6th, Penny awoke and found Sadie and Wendy in bed with her, though Antoinette was not present. The girls attended Bible school on Sundays, and Antoinette is said to have been very devoted and interested in her faith. She often looked forward to Sundays due to this, but on this particular Sunday, she was nowhere to be found. Penny wasn't generally concerned in that moment, as Antoinette was often up early doing work around the house, prepping breakfast, whatever she might get herself into. It wasn't until Penny began moving around the apartment that she got worried, as there was no indication that Antoinette was in the house. I've read a few reports that suggest that at the time Penny called 911, believed to be approximately 11 a.m. on Sunday, she was told she had to wait 24 hours before reporting her daughter missing. I've also read that she was told that she had to wait eight hours and called the police again at 8 p.m. Deputy Chief of Police John Allen would later say, quote, Back then, we had to wait 24 hours before considering a child missing. End quote. The official search for Antoinette did not begin until the next day, Monday, April 7th more than 24 hours after she was last seen. When police arrived, their first steps were to speak with Penny, Sadie, and Wendy, while other investigators went through the apartment. At the time, one of the children reportedly told police about the knocks on the door, though Penny said she did not hear them, and that Antoinette knew better than to open the door to a stranger. In the apartment, it was quick to note that there was nothing which indicated forced entry or any kind of a struggle, and so police initially believed that Antoinette may have gone along willingly with her abductor. Perhaps it was someone she knew. It was also reported at the time that none of Antoinette's clothing was missing from the home other than the knee-length pink nightgown she was wearing. The Gallup Police Department didn't wait long at all to involve the state police, as well as reaching out for assistance from the FBI. The search, which would last through Wednesday, involved multiple agencies as well as local volunteers and the state police search and rescue team. Early on in the search, a tracking dog was brought in, though it failed to pick up Antoinette's scent outside of the apartment. The search, which began close to the home, would eventually spin out for several miles, expanding across the entire town of Gallup until the radius was 25 miles. While some searched in the foothills, others went door-to-door -door displaying photos of Antoinette, looking for anyone who may have seen the nine-year-old in the hours or days prior to her disappearance. A neighbor of Penny said that on the morning of Antoinette's disappearance, she noted the presence of an old brown truck, or possibly a van, with New Mexico plates parked in front of the apartment. According to interviews with this neighbor, she didn't think much about the vehicle being there as it wasn't uncommon for people to come and go from Penny's home at all hours of the night. The neighbor would go on to explain that she witnessed a man exiting the vehicle, approaching the front door of the home, and knocking sometime between 6.30 and 7 a.m. The witness stated that she didn't pay much attention beyond that as, again, it was fairly typical for people to be visiting the home at different times. This statement was corroborated by at least one other neighbor who noted the presence of the brown vehicle. No witness was able to describe the man seen approaching the home. When authorities spoke to Penny and other members of the family, none of them could think of anyone who owned a brown truck or van. One interesting detail which was discovered during follow-up questioning had to do with the door to the home. As previously mentioned, Penny noted that she had locked the door when she'd come home and found it unlocked the next morning. However, 
Penny added that she had also locked the screen door, meaning that had Antoinette opened the apartment door, she'd also have had to have unlatched the screen door for the perpetrator to be able to grab her. Authorities felt this more strongly connected to Antoinette knowing her abductor, though others have argued that jimmying open the latch for a screen door isn't exactly a challenge, and the abductor could have opened the screen and been waiting for Antoinette to open the inner door. For police, though, had Antoinette been taken by someone she knew, the question became about motive. There'd been no ransom demands. There'd been no contact with the abductor at all. Typically, in child abduction cases, authorities go by statistics, which suggests that 74% of abducted children are murdered within the first three hours of the abduction. Unfortunately, the case revolving around Anthonette began growing cold almost from the first day. After the initial reports of knocks on the door, a brown vehicle, a man seen approaching the apartment, nothing more could be developed. Tips were called in, tracked down, and led to nothing. While the family was increasingly frustrated by the way law enforcement was handling the case, law enforcement felt like the family wasn't telling them everything that they knew. On April 12th, 1987, one year and six days after Antoinette's abduction, the Gallup Police Department received a disturbing phone call. On the call, a young woman identifies herself as Antoinette Cayadito before another voice is heard confronting her about being on the phone, and then the young woman's screams can be heard as she is forcibly removed from the phone. I will now play audio of this 911 call. The call was automatically recorded, though did not last long enough for police to be able to trace its exact point of origin. However, while the person speaking says she is in Albuquerque, it has since been revealed that the call is known to have originated from Gallup. The call has been described as being 40 seconds long, though the audio release is only 22 seconds. Reportedly, in the full version, a second voice described as an elderly male can be heard. And whether or not the adult voice actually heard in this clip is male or female is up for debate, though authorities did believe it to be male. When the audio was played for Penny, she was adamant that it was her daughter Antoinette's voice. The legitimacy of this call has been hotly debated over the years. While many believe the call is the real thing and that it was, in fact, Antoinette, others have argued it could have been a prank call or perhaps something more sinister. The primary issue with this call comes from the fact that while it rang in to the Gallup police, it was not a 911 call. The person who made this call had directly dialed the local number for the Gallup Police Department, its non-emergency number, making many wonder if this was Antoinette and she was trying to get help. Why wouldn't she have simply dialed 911? Sadly, there have been no further developments in Antoinette's case. On April 18th, 1999, Antoinette's mother, Penny, passed away at the age of 46. Her death was hardly reported on at the time, with it being mentioned only on one page of an Arizona newspaper, as Penny was in Phoenix at the time of her death. 37 years later, and the case remains in this broken, stagnant state. However, new information revealed by a reporter and an investigator digging back into the case files have revealed shocking details about the investigation, which have thrown the entire narrative, as it has been told for more than three decades, into utter chaos. Case Update On Saturday, April 1st, 2023, former New Mexico television news reporter Crystal Gutierrez released a new episode of her show, Beyond the Case. On this show, Gutierrez and her associates dig into cold cases in hopes of finding new information and rejuvenating the investigations which have seemingly fallen by the wayside. 
During her investigation into Antoinette's case, several new details were revealed, which had previously been kept from the public. This new information not only transformed the entire shape of Antoinette's case, but also provided a possible scenario of how exactly Antoinette was abducted. And unfortunately, it's beginning to appear that the story that's been told since 1986 may be based more on lies and a cover-up than the truth. Amongst the new information revealed by these files was a bizarre connection between three people. Antoinette's mother, Penny, her then best friend, a man named Ronald Perry, and another man named Emilio Gardella, who Perry had allegedly introduced to Penny not long before Antoinette's disappearance. According to statements taken from both Gallup Police interviews as well as FBI interviews, Emilio, known to everyone at the time as Emo, seemed to have a disturbing interest in then nine-year-old Antoinette. Multiple witnesses reported that in the days leading up to her disappearance, Emo had presented the child with several gifts, including flowers and a necklace. According to Antoinette's sister Sadie, the night of her disappearance, her mother was getting ready for a night out when this Emo character showed up. He presented Antoinette with flowers and a necklace, at which time he picked up the child and sat her on his lap. According to Sadie, Antoinette was deeply uncomfortable with this and was frightened of the man. She went on to explain to be on the case, saying, quote, I remember Antoinette being scared. Antoinette was our mother hen. She kept us with her all the time. My mom had frequent parties at the house, so when people came around, it was always Antoinette taking us to her room or just keeping us out of that environment. We grabbed her, I grabbed her, and got her off of his lap and we went to her room, end quote. During her interview with Crystal Gutierrez, Sadie mentioned that wasn't the only thing out of the ordinary that night. According to her, Penny sent Sadie and Wendy to bed and said that she and Antoinette were staying up late to play cards. Sadie stated that this was not something which was normally done as she couldn't remember another time where Antoinette was allowed to stay up that late let alone to play cards. Part of what makes this so interesting is that Sadie's statements are in direct contradiction with what Penny told investigators happened that night, as I'm sure you're noticing when comparing this information to the summary I presented. Now, interestingly, police reports show that when Penny reported Antoinette missing, she relayed several details which have since been ruled untruthful. She stated that she last saw Antoinette around 3 a.m., and that when she awoke around 7, she was gone. She also claimed that Wendy and Sadie were sleeping in their own rooms that night, but Sadie has stated they were all sleeping together in Penny's bedroom, as they always did. While Sadie can't remember with absolute certainty, she did address the knocking at the door. She recalls being awake for the first knock, and that her mother said it was a neighbor and not to worry about it. Police would later confirm that these initial knocks came from a man named Roger Plummer, who lived not far from the Cayadito home. Sadie explained that she could hear the man's voice from outside saying, Come on, Penny, just let me in. Roger later told detectives that around 3 or 3.30 a.m., he did knock on the door and a bedroom window. He claimed that he was checking on Penny after they had gotten into an argument at the bar. Roger says he left the house and stayed with a friend down the street. Police later confirmed this story with the owner of the home. Now, while details of a second knock would be relayed into the investigation, this story wouldn't come up until eight years after Antoinette's disappearance. In 1994, when being interviewed by the FBI, Penny stated that there came a second series of knocks on the door sometime between 3.30 and 4.30 a.m. Her youngest daughter, Wendy, who was too young to even remember Antoinette, would corroborate this story. Sadie explained to be on the case that she never heard the second knock, and while she had heard her mother and sister discussing it years later, she struggles to believe it ever actually happened. This was the knock where a man allegedly claimed to be Uncle Joe. Detectives did dig into this and were able to confirm that whoever knocked that night if indeed someone did, 
it could not have been the man they knew as Uncle Joe. According to Sadie, even were there a second knock that night, Antoinette would never have gone to answer it. As she explained, quote, Even if somebody was knocking in the middle of the night, we knew better than to open that door. You do not open that door to anybody. You ask who it is. We were not allowed to open the door to anyone. That was like the golden rule, end quote. The next morning, according to Sadie, her mother woke them up for church and noted that she couldn't find Anthemette and asked them to search around for her. Penny reportedly stated that she had found the front door unlocked and ajar, but again, Sadie finds this hard to believe. She explained that her mother was very big on home security, saying, quote, she called it lockdown. We'd go around the house and behind each other and lock the windows, make sure the door was locked, and then my mom was the final check, end quote. Strangely, the necklace, previously mentioned as having been a gift to Anthonette from Emo, remained in the home even after her disappearance. Sadie stated that her mother kept an altar-like setup where people could leave things for Anthonette. One of the items that was always there was that necklace, leading many to wonder if it had been a gift to Anthonette the night of her disappearance, why would you keep that on an altar to your missing daughter, especially knowing it was a gift from an adult man to a nine-year-old? It doesn't make a great deal of sense and seems a truly bizarre item to try and remember your child by. Asked her thoughts and memories about Emo, Sadie replied, quote, He always came with another man, and I would say, like, maybe, I don't know how much time prior that they used to come, but he never came to the house by himself. He was always with this other man, and that other man was my mother's best friend. Ronald is the one who introduced this man to my mom. Ronald Perry and my mom were best friends, always. When my mom partied, he was always one of the ones who was there. The night of Antoinette's disappearance, though, Emo had shown up by himself. End quote. Sadie went on to state that she never saw Emo again after her sister's disappearance, and that for reasons she has never been privy to, the tight friendship between her mother and Ronald Perry was irreparably damaged at the same time. According to Sadie, despite how close they had been, Ronald Perry and Penny Cayadito never spoke again after Anthonette's disappearance. The reason for this divide is currently unknown, and attempts to locate and speak with Ronald Perry have been fruitless. Penny does not mention the name Emo to investigators, until four days after Antoinette is reported missing. And even when she does, it's not information she offers up voluntarily. Instead, while police are conducting a search, another family member brings this guy up and starts talking about the weird gifts and strange behavior around the missing nine-year-old. Then, as if her memory were jogged, Penny remembers Emo and tells detectives what she knows about him though at the time she claims to have only met him recently and states that she doesn't know him well. When detectives began asking others about Emo, they got corroborative information from several sources who stated they had seen Emo presenting Anthonette with flowers on three separate occasions prior to her disappearance. Interestingly, police reports show that one of the people they questioned about Emo was Ronald Perry, Perry told investigators that he was present the day of Anthonette's disappearance when Emo bought the flowers, but that he was not at the home later that night when Emo presented them. Asked if he believed the flowers were for Penny, perhaps, Ronald replied that as far as he knew, the relationship between Penny and Emo was friendship and never anything romantic. While Penny maintained the same story she had initially told investigators, Eight long years later, in March of 1994, she was called down to be interviewed by the FBI. It's during this interview that she suddenly changes her story, adding in new details and removing old ones, and the answers she supplies are so suspect that the FBI agents speaking with her begin asking her questions more in line with what they might ask a direct suspect rather than a parent. As it turned out, however, they weren't completely in the dark. 
What ultimately prompts Penny to start telling a new story is when the agents tell her in no uncertain terms that they possess evidence which leads them to believe that she may have been involved in her daughter's disappearance. On Tuesday, March 1st, the FBI conducted two separate interviews with Penny. They asked her to walk them through the story of what exactly went on that night, and nearly from the first details, they begin to realize that this is a different story. According to the files, Penny told the FBI that she was laying in bed with Antoinette when a knock came at the door, sometime between 3.30 and 4.30 a.m. Penny then stated, quote, I told her to go ahead and answer it. I laid there for a period of time, maybe 30 minutes, and Antoinette never came back. I got up to see where she was, but I couldn't find her, end quote. So just to make this evidently clear, the story Penny is now telling is that after hearing a knock early in the morning, rather than ignoring it as had always been her policy, she strangely makes the choice to have her nine-year-old daughter answer it. Then, when Antoinette doesn't return, she doesn't go to check for her for approximately 30 minutes. However, she also adds in that by the time she was starting to look for her, it was getting light outside. For the record, Sunrise on Sunday, April 6, 1986, in Gallup, New Mexico, was recorded as taking place at 5.52 a.m., with civil twilight occurring 30 minutes earlier, around 5.25. As I'm sure you're noticing, even in this FBI interview, Penny's details are not matching up with the timeline. Now, here is where things turn sickeningly curious. The official FBI report reads, quote, when advised that the FBI had information that she was directly implicated, Penny Cayadito stated the words, What if I told you Emo and I did this? Would we both go to prison? Cayadito stated that she and Emo got together on a plan prior to her daughter's disappearance. End quote. Now, this is pretty shocking information to come out during the interview. You're speaking with the mother of a child who's been missing for eight years. And right when you start telling her you've got reason to believe she was involved, she wants to know if she would go to prison? Now, no solid proof exists to show exactly what happened to Antoinette the night of her disappearance, but I can damn sure tell you her mother isn't going to offer up this story about Emo and her own complicity unless there's some truth to it. The report goes on to state that Penny told the FBI that Emo Gardella and Ronald Perry came to her house one night. Penny says that she told the men that Antoinette was becoming a problem in her life and she wanted to get her out of Gallup to another place where maybe she had a shot at a better life. According to Penny, it was Emo who spoke up and said he could be the person to take Antoinette away. According to the report, Penny said she would want to know where her daughter was going, but one of the men advised her that she'd be better off not knowing. Penny then confirmed that Emo had come to the house the evening of Antoinette's disappearance, offering her nine-year-old daughter two roses. According to her interview, Penny said that when the daylight began breaking, she started having second thoughts about the deal she had made. Reportedly in these files, there are detailed records reported by Penny of her attempts to track down and retrieve her daughter. However, she could never locate her. Of course, you may be thinking what I am, which is, if you wanted to find your daughter, maybe tell the investigators all this at the time and not eight years later. While no one can prove it, it has since been theorized that Penny may have sold her daughter, either for money, alcohol, or possibly drugs. It has since been revealed that Penny had associations with many drug dealers, and as a result, local police had raided her home more than once prior to the disappearance. While there is nothing in Penny's FBI interview which details the plan, how it worked, or what she may have received in return for what appears to be the sale of her own daughter, she does state her belief that Ronald Perry knows where Antoinette was taken but would not reveal it to her. Whether or not this is accurate is difficult to say, and whether or not investigators have spoken with Perry since 1994 is uncertain. However, it was reported that Ronald and Emo took polygraph tests, though at this time the results have not been revealed. 
Detective Juan Reyes worked Antonette's case for years and has made it adequately clear that he believed almost nothing that came out of her mother's mouth. According to him, from early on in the investigation, he encountered so many red flags when it came to Penny, Emo, Ronald, and others associated with the case that he wasn't sure exactly what to do. While Detective Reyes noted that the FBI did provide him with information from their investigation, they never supplied him with Penny's interview, a piece of evidence he believes could have changed everything. He could never get enough probable cause to make an arrest, and being showed the interview for the first time more than 30 years later, he couldn't for the life of him understand why the FBI hadn't done anything. Detective Reyes explained, quote, How does your daughter disappear right after you get home? Knock on the door and then all of a sudden she's gone? I used every technique on this lady and she was just straight, help me find my child. I look at the FBI and go, wait a minute. Why would she be telling the agent, if I tell you, me and this guy, would I go to prison? Well, yeah, that's a big clue now. That's why I don't understand why the FBI didn't do anything. End quote. Sadie stated to Beyond the Case that she had always wondered if drugs had played a role in her sister's disappearance. She mentioned the previous drug raid and also noted that her mother was close with and spent a lot of time with known drug dealers and in addition to this, had developed her own problems with addiction. Following Antoinette's disappearance, Sadie moved in with her father while Wendy stayed at home with their mother. Things went downhill from there. Penny would have several breakdowns over the years and even attempted to take her own life on at least one occasion. Finally, while there is no solid evidence to confirm Antoinette is still alive, there have been many sightings of her reported over the years, even as recently as in October of 2015, when a caller claimed to have seen her in Las Vegas. While most investigators do not believe she is still alive, noting that she's never surfaced or taken claim of her name, they can't rule it out entirely. If indeed Antoinette was sold to someone, she may have been trafficked, or she may be out there living a completely different life, perhaps actively avoiding coming forward due to fear or reasons unknown. However, one email included in the police reports obtained by Gutierrez show that investigators have their attention focused on someone, as they have requested that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children put up age-progressed flyers of Antoinette in specific locations. That email includes the following question, quote, Is the known suspect still living in redacted area? End quote. It's taken nearly four decades, but it looks like the truth about Antoinette's disappearance is beginning to slowly trickle out, and there is some hope that this trickle can turn into a deluge. Sadly, it seems, Penny was involved in the sale of her own daughter, be it for money, drugs, alcohol, or something else. While that cannot currently be proven, that seems to be what everything is pointing towards. She allegedly tried to find her daughter years later, but I personally find that difficult to believe. If she wanted her daughter found, all she had to do was start talking the truth. Instead, she chose to take the most pertinent details with her to the grave. So now, attention turns towards Emilio Gardella and Ronald Perry. While neither has ever been listed as a suspect or even a person of interest, to say law enforcement has some questions for them would be an understatement. Hopefully, sooner than later, the truth will be discovered and Antoinette might be found. Someone out there has the answers to this haunting, disturbing, and heartbreaking mystery. I want to note, I'm going to send out some Freedom of Information Act requests and see what files I can get my hands on. I was denied these files when I initially did my episode on Antoinette, but now maybe the wheels have been greased. Should I obtain these files, I'll dig in deep and release a full-length update delivering everything that I can find. I just hope that this spark is enough to ignite the blaze that burns away all of the lies and finally reveals the right direction to go.
If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Antoinette Cayadito, there are many websites and newspapers detailing her case, although now it appears many of those details are wrong. Crystal Gutierrez's show, Beyond the Case, did an amazing job with their two-part episode on Antoinette, and I cannot recommend it more highly. You will find the links to those episodes in the show notes. If you have any information about the disappearance of Antoinette Cayadito, please contact the Gallup, New Mexico Police Department at 505-863-9365. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine, Andrew Guarino, Anne Bertram, Camelia Tyler, Christine Greco, Danny Renee, Deerthy, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eloanne Meyer, Fabulous TT, Guillerme Pinto, Jennifer Winkler, Julie A. Mangano, Justin Snyder, Kara Moreland, K.Y., Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B., Madison LaHoulier, Marla Wright, Melissa Brekhuizen, Nick Mohar Shures, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stacey Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tiffany Nelson, and Tom Radford. Without your amazing support, this show would not be possible. So thank you all so much for contributing to Trace Evidence. One quick reminder, if you're planning on attending CrimeCon this year in Orlando, Florida, use promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com to save 10% off your pass. Once again, that's promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit trace-evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. This concludes, for the moment, the updates for Antoinette's case, But this is far from over. Things are finally starting to heat up, and I truly believe the answers are coming. I only hope that if there is someone out there that's been holding on to information for all these years, they'll finally bring it forward and help bring an end to this terrible nightmare. As always, I will keep you informed of any additional updates as they come. I want to thank you again for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another Unsolved Case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.